In this short video, we're going to look at conditions for invertibility. In other words, we're going to try to make connections from many of the topics that we have studied, which will ensure that a linear operator, or equivalently, the standard matrix of a linear operator, is an invertible operator. So we learn from the definition that a linear operator is invertible if it is both on two and one to one. But when you have an operator, you get both or neither. If you have a linear operator, it's either both one to one and on two, or it's neither one to one nor on two. So we could break this into a couple of categories. We could look for conditions which ensure that t is one to one. If we know of a condition which ensures that t is one to one, then we would know that the operator is invertible. On the other hand, we could look for conditions which ensure that t is on to that would ensure that t is invertible. So let's start with one to one. So there's many, many different conditions or characterizations of a one to one operator. Uh, some of them deal with the operator directly and some of them deal with its standard matrix. So for example, if you have a one-to-one -one operator, then both its kernel and the null space of its standard matrix should be trivial. That is, they should only contain the zero vector. And as a result, the nullity of t as a linear operator, or the nullity of its standard matrix, is going to be zero. When we talk about onto, we should be always thinking about columns of the standard matrix. And so for any linear transformation, even if it's not an operator, it will be one to one if its columns form a linearly independent set. So T is an operator, so it has N columns. And so we'd like to have the columns span all of our N. And again, from our two for one theorem, since we have n columns, if they are either linearly independent or if they span all of Rn, then they'll form a basis for Rn. And any of those conditions ensure that T is an invertible operator. What about the reduced row echelon form of T? Well, again, even if t is just a linear transformation, we don't know if, it, if it's a linear operator, but any linear transformation, if it's standard matrix, when reduced to, reduced to row echelon form, has no free variables, uh, then we know it is one to one. But since t is an operator, its standard matrix is square, if there's no free variables, then the reduced row echelon form will be the identity matrix. There's even more ways we can characterize a one-to-one -one operator in terms of linear systems. If we have this homogeneous linear system, uh, the standard matrix of t times x equals 0. If the only solution is the trivial solution x equals 0, really that's just another way of saying that the kernel of t is trivial, consists of the 0 vector only. If for every right-hand side the uh, linear system uh, tx equals b has a unique solution. Well, that's really one-to-one. -one. That says that uh, for every b, all right, so I'll use some math shorthand here, for all b belonging to rn, 
we have a unique so the B is your output vector so we're going to have a unique input vector uh, such that that input is mapped onto the output vector B. So this is just saying uh, for each output there is only one input. Or when we were working with scalar functions, we would say for each Y there is only one X. That's what that statement says. And then the last one is an indirect way of saying that the kernel of T has to be trivial. What this is saying is that if you just find one vector where this linear system has a unique solution, then every uh, right-hand side should also have a system with a unique solution. Uh, because if there's any system that does not have a unique solution, that would imply that the uh, standard matrix has a non-trivial null space, in which case no vector would have a unique solution. So those statements all dealt with T being onto, or showing that T was onto. What can we say that will ensure that, uh, I'm sorry, those statements said were about one to one. What about onto? Well, onto by definition means that the range is all of the codomain, so all of Rn. Well, the range of the linear operator is the same as the column space of its standard matrix, and so that would mean the column space of the standard matrix should be all of Rn. And both of those statements say that the rank of T as a linear operator, or the rank of uh, the standard matrix is going to be N. When we're thinking about onto, we should be thinking about the rows of the standard matrix. For any linear transformation, if the rows of T form a linearly independent set, then that linear transformation is going to be onto. But if we have an operator, like we do in our case here, then we also want those rows to span all of our n. And uh, because there's n rows, if we have either linear independence or we know that they span all of our n, then we have a basis for our n. In any of those conditions, ensure that t is onto, which in turn ensures that T is invertible. In terms of the reduced row echelon form of the standard matrix, it should have no row of zeros. Again, that should be true for any onto linear transformation, but since the standard matrix for an operator is square, then when there's no row of zeros, the reduced row echelon form will be the identity matrix. And then in terms of linear systems, onto says that if you take any vector uh, in Rn, there should be some other vector, x, which gets mapped onto that vector b by the linear transformation t. That's what onto would mean. So let's look at these same conditions again, but instead of just splitting them in between uh, onto and one to one, let's kind of associate them or group them uh, based on the objects that they deal with. So for example, these conditions all deal with the sets, either the set of column vectors or the set of row vectors. And so if the set of column vectors form a basis, uh, which would be the same because you have n of them, 
if they're linearly independent or if they span all of Rn, then the matrix A would be invertible and the associated linear operator would be invertible as well. You can say the same thing about the set of columns. So notice that we could also say that if the columns of A form a basis for Rn, the rows must as well. If the columns are linearly independent, if you have a square matrix and the columns are linearly independent, then the rows have to be linearly independent. And again, if you have a square matrix, if the columns span all of Rn, then the rows have to span all of Rn. And if you have any of those conditions, A is invertible and the associated linear operator T is also invertible. We saw several conditions that dealt with systems of equations. We said that if the homogeneous system has only the trivial solution, that says that the kernel it is trivial, which means that it would have to be one-to-one, -one, therefore invertible. If it's consistent, if you have AX equals B is consistent for all right-hand sides, uh, then what does that say? That says that it's on to. So it would be invertible. If you have exactly one solution for all uh, right-hand sides, then that says it's one-to-one. -one. And then this last statement was that one that was a little bit indirect, but it was saying the same as the first statement that the null space is trivial. We could also have the conditions related to the fundamental spaces. So if we know that the column space of the matrix A or the row space is all of Rn, A is invertible. If the null space of A is trivial, A is invertible. And if the nullity of A is 0 or the rank of A is n, A would be invertible. And then in terms of matrix operations, we would say that the reduced row echelon form of A should have no free columns and no row of zeros, meaning that it's the identity matrix. And then something that we saw in the last video is that you can actually write A as the product of elementary matrices. Why is that? Because remember that we reduce A to the identity uh, using elementary row operations, that's equivalent to multiplying the matrix on the right by elementary matrices. And we found out that, oh, okay, uh, we're going to get a, a product of elementary matrices times A, which is going to be the identity matrix. And then that means we could undo those elementary row operations to get to A inverse. All right, um, what else? Oh, the properties of linear operators. If we know something about the linear operator, if we know if it's one-to-one -one or on two, then it's going to be invertible. If we know its kernel is trivial, it's invertible, which would be the same as saying that its nullity is zero. If we uh, know that the range is all of our n, that's on two, then that means its rank is n. And all of those conditions ensure that T is invertible. So now we've got a lot of them. And we're going to list 22. We may have actually listed more. And we haven't even talked about the transpose of A. Now there's conditions on the transpose. And, and, and certainly, since the row space of A is the column space of A transpose, and if A is a square matrix, then everything that we say about A we have a corresponding statement for A transpose. So in particular, if A is invertible, its transpose is invertible as well. But here they are. Uh, let's just go through them a little bit quickly here. Uh, obviously, T is invertible if and only if its standard matrix is invertible. Uh, 
uh, we saw that we could get the uh, reduced row echelon form. That has to be the identity matrix. No free variables, no uh, row of zeros. Uh, we can write A as the product of elementary matrices. Of course, T being one-to-one -one or onto. Uh, what does it mean for one-to-one? -one? Well, the kernel of T, which is the null space of A, is trivial, which means the nullity is going to be zero. What else? Uh, we could talk about the uh, range of T and the rank. The range has to be all of Rn, the rank has to be n. Um, let's talk about columns. The column space would have to be all of Rn, or they form a basis, or because we have n of them, they could just be linearly independent or span all of Rn. Then we could talk about the row space. And gen before we talk about the row space, remember columns we always associate with one to one. Rows we associate with being on to. And finally, we have the statements about the linear systems as well, which will ensure that the matrix A is invertible, which means, of course, that the associated linear operator is invertible as well. Now, before we talk about the composition of operators, because this is an interesting fact that if you have two invertible operators and you join them together through composition, compose them, then that composition is going to be invertible. But composition is not the only way we can combine two linear operators. For example, if I have T1 and T2 are invertible linear operators, must their sum be invertible? Well, it, it might be, but does it have to be? And the answer is no, because if I just let T1, let's just have it go from R2 to R2. So the input vector is just going to be x, y, and the output vector is going to be negative x, comma y. So the x-coordinate is the opposite. The y-coordinate stayed the same. That's a reflection in the y-axis. axis. And then I could have uh, t2 again be a linear operator from r2 into r2. And now we'll keep the x component the same, but we'll change the sign on the y component. That's a reflection in the x-axis. Well, let's put them together. If I add them together, t1 plus t2, oops, t2, I would just add the outputs together. Well, I'd have negative x plus x, y plus negative y, and I would just get 0 comma 0. So here's an example where I have two operators. They're clearly invertible, right? We talked about reflections. Reflections are always invertible. But if I add them together, I get the null or the zero operator, right? Every vector in R2 is mapped to the zero vector which is definitely not an invertible. It's definitely not one-to-one. -one. Every vector is getting mapped to the same thing. So it's definitely not invertible. So if you take the sum of two invertible uh, operators or invertible matrices, uh, you may get something that is not invertible. And you, but you may. You may or may not. There's just simply no guarantee. Um, so. We can combine linear operators by uh, adding them together. We could also take a linear operator and multiply it by a scalar. If you multiply it by a non-zero scalar, that's very important, uh, then actually uh, the operator k times t1 is invertible. So if you start with an invertible operator, you multiply it by a non-zero scalar, then um, 
you get an invertible operator and it's pretty easy to see or easy to verify that you would just get 1 over k times t1 inverse as the inverse of the scaled uh, operator. Uh, and so that should make sense. If I multiply, uh, if I multiply these, if I uh, compose these together, if I take uh, 1 over k times t1 inverse, and I compose that with k times t1, well, 1 over k times k is just going to be 1. And I'll multiply that times uh, t inverse composed with t, uh, which is just the identity operator. All right, so that's just going to be the identity operator on Rn. So point being is that uh, in our arithmetic, multiplying by a non-zero scalar will keep the uh, matrix or matrix the linear operator invertible it's true about matrices as well but adding them together um, may or may not result in an invertible matrix but what we were talking about so back to our regularly scheduled program here is we said that if you have two invertible operators and you combine them through composition, then the composition is invertible. And then likewise, if you look at their standard matrices, remember the standard matrix for the composition is the product of those two standard matrices, that it is going to be invertible. And look at this, that the composition, let me say this correctly, the inverse of the composition is the composition of the inverses in reverse order. So I start with T2 composed with T1, but that's going to be T1 inverse composed with T2 inverse. The order has changed. And with matrices, the order changes as well. The inverse of the product AB is the product of B inverse times A inverse. We've reversed the order. Now, why would that make sense? Well, we can think of it really, it, it, our common sense doesn't always help us in linear algebra, but in this case it sure does. Uh, if you think of the shoes and socks principle, uh, when you're getting dressed, what do you do? You put on your socks, then you put on your shoes. And then you can't take your socks off first. You gotta take your shoes off first, then your socks. So whenever you have two operations being performed in order, you do A, then B, to undo them, you're going to first undo B, and then undo A. Let's see if we can think of this uh, with some uh, algebra, some matrix algebra. So again, if, remember, if you have AB and you multiply it times its inverse, either on the left or on the right, you're going to get the identity matrix. So let's think of the inverse of AB as the product of two matrices, X and Y. And we want XY to undo the action of AB. Well, that means if I take XY and multiply it times AB, I should get the identity matrix. In other words, I, I should undo A and then undo B. Well, let's just rearrange the parentheses there. And in the middle here, I have Y times A. So, if y can undo a, then I'm halfway there, halfway towards getting to the identity matrix. So in order for y to undo a, y will have to be a inverse. That doesn't get me there all the way, but now I'm just left with x, because if y uh, 
is A inverse. Well, A inverse times A is the identity matrix. And the identity matrix times X would just give me X. So now I want the product XB. Remember, I've reduced the product of XY times AB down to AB, I mean, sorry, XB, when Y equals A inverse. I want this to be the identity, which means that X is going to have to be B inverse. So the product XY would be B inverse times A inverse. In other words, the inverse of the product AB is the product B inverse times A inverse. And we can apply the same idea when we multiply on the right. So I won't go through the details, but again, it's just a matter of, oh, I need to undo B from the right, so I'll have B inverse coming from the right, B inverse first, and then A inverse. Now, we just saw that if you have two invertible linear operators and you form their composition, that the composition is going to be invertible. But the converse is also true. What do I mean by the converse? That if you have a composition of two linear operators, they have to be operators, if the composition is invertible, then that implies that both operators T1 and T2 must be invertible. So we can state that formally. If we have two linear operators, obviously they have to be compatible. They have to go from the same input space and have the same output space. If they're both linear operators and their composition is invertible, then both of the individual operators have to be invertible as well. And then for matrices, what that means is that if you know that the product of two square matrices, again, n by n matrices, if the product of two square matrices is invertible, then both A and B are invertible. Now, we can actually sketch a little proof. It's, it's not a formal proof, but it should make sense to us that if we have the product of two square matrices is invertible, then we should be able to show that A and B are both invertible. So let's just start with the fact that if AB is invertible, then we have an inverse. We'll just call that matrix C for now, where C times AB is the identity, or AB times C is the identity. So C is just the inverse of AB. But if I just start with this first equation, I can rearrange the parentheses here and say CA multiplied times B is the identity. Well, that's our condition for showing that B is invertible. That would say that CA would be the inverse of B. And since B has an inverse, it must be invertible. And on the other hand, if I look at this condition here, that AB times its inverse is the identity matrix, I can rearrange the parentheses again. And this says that A times this matrix is the identity. And that says that this matrix BC should be the inverse of A. So A is invertible. So we've shown that if the product AB is invertible, B must be invertible, and A must be invertible. But we get a bonus from this, too. We said that, OK, if C is our, the inverse of AB, then B inverse is going to be the matrix C times A. So let's start with this equation. B inverse equals C times A. Multiply on both sides on the, oops, on the, on the right by A inverse. So I'll get B inverse times A inverse uh, on the left-hand side. C times A times A inverse. But of course, A times A inverse is just the identity matrix.
and C times the identity matrix is just C. So if we remember that C is the inverse of the product AB, then we've just shown that the inverse of AB is B inverse times A inverse. So I hope that uh, you are able to follow along with all of the connections between many of the topics that we've studied and the idea of invertibility. And I hope that now, after we talked about this, uh, that the product of two matrices, two invertible matrices, is invertible, and we have a formula for the inverse. It is the product of the inverses, but in reverse order.